Bibles to the book of Amos, chapter 4. It's kind of a hard book to find. I hope I can find it. <laughs> I have to have one of these kids come over here. Oh, I got it. I beat you. Amos chapter 4. We're going to go to verse 12. Am I on, brother? Yeah. Alright, I hope you like history this morning because if you do, this is going to be a trick for you. You may know a lot of what I'm going to give you, but I'm going to take an event. Um, sometimes, you know, preachers can preach different ways. They can take a verse and just go on it and just preach that one verse. I'm going to take an event from history and I'm going to take that event, give you some things about that event, try to teach you something and from the Word of God and show you how they didn't line up with God's Word and teach you and try to show you the way of salvation, alright? So let's get started in Amos chapter 4, verse 12. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto me, mm, listen to this right here, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. What a verse! What a verse to make you think. He said, prepare to meet thy God. Now, I don't know about you, but that got my attention. When I meet God, I want to be prepared. Amen. I want to know all the circumstances of how am I going to meet Him? When am I going to meet Him? What's He expect of me when I meet God? When I stand before God, what's it going to be like? Where am I going to be at? And I want to make sure everything between me and God is okay. Amen. You, you agree? Amen. I think that's the most important thing a person can do. Is to be prepared to meet God. Right. And I tell you what, by the authority of God's Word this, this morning, you can be 100% prepared to meet God when you meet Him. When you stand before Him, you can be ready. Now, there might be things in your life that you don't like. There might be some things that, you know, you're not doing right and some things that you need to get, that you and the Lord got to deal out. But as far as going to heaven, as far as not going to hell, as far as you having peace with God, as far as you know everything is okay between you and the Lord, you can have that today. Yes. I'll show you yes. how you can have it. God said, prepare to meet Him. Prepare to meet Him. Hosea Chapter 1, verse 5. I want to give you this verse. He said, Now therefore thus saith the Lord, Consider your ways. I tell you what, that's another verse, ain't it? Consider. That means to think about the path you're on. Think about the life that you're living. Think about how you are with God. How you are with your family. How you are at your job. All the things. Consider your ways. How does it stack up? Amen. Consider your ways. What I want to preach to you this morning, I want to give you the title, The Unsinkable, Sinkable Ship. Y'all get that? The title is The Unsinkable, Sinkable Ship. Now, some of you here today may have heard of a ship called the RMS Titanic. Have y'all heard that before? Yeah. For some reason, and, and not, I shouldn't say for some reason, but America, the world is fascinated with the story of the Titanic. There's been movies and novels and stories and they've brought survivors and I think actually the last survivor died just a few years ago. But they've had them tell their story over and over. The RMS Titanic was supposed to be the unsinkable ship. It has been said. Now I know sometimes legend can become truth you know, and people say things, and it's been almost, it's been over a hundred years. But as far as I can tell, it was said by the captain of the ship, Captain Smith, that the Titanic, that God Himself could not sink this ship. That is, that is what has been said that the captain said. That God Himself could not sink this ship. Well, we know now that it was sinkable. Yes, sir. Yeah, right. And there was flaws. There were things that they cut corners on. There were warnings missed. There were warnings ignored to cause 
that ship to go down on that fateful night. Man has always had a problem with his pride thinking that everything is going to be okay. You may sit there this morning thinking, I'm okay. Everything's alright. I've got a job. My family's here. Everything's... I'm alright. Man has always had that fault. Thinking that everything is okay. Every once in a while, God will send some warnings. God will send some wake-up calls to remind you that man is just a frail piece of dirt that is capable of nothing without God. You are capable of nothing. I don't say that to be mean or derogative toward you. I say that because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that we're dust and we're made from the ground. And without Jesus, without God, we have no hope. Right. And you're capable of nothing. Yeah. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ. Amen. I can do all things through Christ. Without Christ, you can do nothing. Many times, driving in a car, I'm sure you've experienced this before if you drive. You're driving down the road and you're going 55 miles an hour Everything's okay. Radio's on. You're having a good trip. And all of a sudden, you see a wreck right in front of you. You see it happen. This has happened to me before. And you see the car wreck. You see what the, the, the metal crashing of the cars. You see the people hurt. And I'm telling you what, when I saw that happen that one time when I seen it, I was, I, you know, I was shaken. I was tore up when I saw that wreck. And I was reminded at just how quickly, just how quickly things can change. Yeah. You may be sitting here this morning on a padded pew in the air conditioning on a hot August day, but my friend, you could have everything turned upside down before you get home today. Right. Your whole world could be turned upside down yeah. before you make it to bed tonight. You could not be here. You could pass away before the sun goes down tonight. Right. We're frail. We need the Lord. Right. And everything, everything can be turned upside down in just a matter of a second. Right. Prepare to meet thy God. Those people on the Titanic, I'm sure they were living it up. Yep. Biggest ship. I'll get into some of this stuff. I'm going to give you some facts. I'm sure they were excited. I'm sure they heard the captain say, the unsinkable ship. There was nothing on their mind about that ship going down. They got on that ship not knowing that in just four days they would be at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Things changed that quick. And it can do that for you. Prepare to meet thy God. Consider thy ways. I was on a plane ride from Dallas, Texas back to Charlotte, North Carolina. If you don't, I may have told this story before, but I got to think about this story. And I do not like flying. It scares me. Even though I preach about having faith and putting your trust in God, I'm a hypocrite. Okay? I'm sorry, church. I'm a hypocrite. When I get on that plane, I tell you what, I'm listening to every sound. That first time I rode a plane, I about passed out. That the landing gear come down. You know that. And I heard that, you know, something open and I thought. We're going now. What was that? I, my boss was with me, and I'm like, "What was that sound?" And I was probably, I was, he said, "That's just the landing gear coming down. You'll be okay." And I'm telling you what, every sound, every time the pilot made a, I was, you know, I was like, oh God, I brought me a <clears throat> MP3 player, and I had on, I was gonna listen to me some Christian music, and I had my earplugs in on the plane, and I pushed the play button. And all of a sudden, I heard Dua Lawson singing, I'll fly away. And I thought, oh God, I can't listen to that. I'm a preacher, but I can't listen to this. I turned it. I thought, oh, i got to find something to help me. So I turned to the next song. All of a sudden, the next song come on, In the Sweet by and by. <laughs> it's my time to go, God. It's a sign. I'm gone. I tell you what, we was flying back from Dallas, and, all, and, 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 and I've flown about six times before, but on this particular trip, I noticed that 
something did go wrong. And I noticed the plane was flying cockeyed. Well, I don't know if it was that, I don't know, I just say that now just looking back. I'm kind of making this up, but I thought it was flying cockeyed, like crooked. So I thought we was flying to there crooked. That sounds good, don't it? And the pilot comes on. He says, uh, passengers, there's no need to be alarmed. Now, when the pilot says that, our radar is up. When the pilot says there no, there's no need to be alarmed, that means Jesus is coming. <laughs> or you're going to Jesus. And he um, said, there's no reason to be alarmed. He said, we've lost an engine. And we'll be taking, we'll be turning around, going back to Dallas uh, for your safety. And I looked over at my mama, who was with us, and she was almost passed out on the floor in shock. And then he comes back on and says, oh, yes, I just want to make sure you're not alarmed by the the, 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 uh, all the fire trucks and ambulances and all that that's going to be on the runway. You're going to see a whole bunch of stuff on the runway. Just don't be alarmed. I thought, oh God, just get me out of the sky. Get me down off this plane. You know what? I realized at that minute how life real is. You know, everything turned out okay. I didn't know that at the time. We made it back safe to Dallas. We had to drug my mama to get her back on the plane. I had to give her some Xanax because she wasn't getting back. She was going to get a bus and drive back. And so we drugged her up to get her back home. But I realized in that instance how frail life can be. How in just one moment of time, everything can be turned upside down. Unfolding in just two hours and 40 terrifying minutes, on a supposedly unsinkable ship as more than 1,500 souls slipped into the icy waters of the North Atlantic while the band played on. Looking back through the years of American history, there has been few non-military events that capture the imagination of so many people like the sinking of the Titanic. The Chicago Fire, the Galveston Hurricane, the San Francisco Hurricane attracted America's attention before that time, but nothing quite like the sinking of the Titanic. The Titanic was 900 feet long. That's as long as three football fields. Big ship. You can actually go on YouTube. I did this last night about 1 o'clock at night. You can go on YouTube and you can see actual footage of the Titanic. And you can see people, it's on YouTube in 1912. It's black and white. It is, uh, you, you need to go. It's amazing. There's actual footage of the ship. And the people on the decks, they're packing up, getting ready to leave. And, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's amazing and it's terrifying at the same time. Knowing just what happened four days later. 825 tons of coal per day was used to keep the Titanic steaming along. The Titanic used 10,000 lamp bulbs. I'd hate to be the one in charge of the lights. No. I think you'd have several. It cost seven and a half million dollars to build the Titanic in, early in the early 1900s. That is, in today's money, just shy of a billion dollars. Or it's a couple hundred million dollars if you did it in today's money. Eight workers were killed during the building of the Titanic. Twenty horses were needed just to transport the anchor. It took 20 horses. The Titanic could carry 3,500 and 47 people, and there were 2,223 people on board, counting passengers and crew. 13 couples, this was fascinating to me, 13 couples were on board the Titanic celebrating their honeymoon. Construction began in March 30, on March 31st, 1909. It took two years, two months to build the Titanic from keel to launch. May 31st, 1911, the Titanic was launched in Belfast, Ireland in the Victoria Channel in Belfast, Black. The Titanic's maiden voyage was to start in Southampton, England, go to Charbourg, France, then on to Queenstown, Ireland, and then finally to New York City. At the time of the Titanic, it took an average boat ship 116 hours, just under five days to sail across the Atlantic Ocean. The captain of the Titanic was Captain Edward John Smith. And if you know anything about history, he would go down with the ship. 
Passengers on the Titanic thought they were to experience the ultimate journey by sea. Yet so many would lose their lives. It's kind of like getting on a cruise ship today. These people had no thought that this thing would actually go down. This was supposed to be something that God could not even see. And they lost their lives. Two months and thir oh, oh, this is amazing. I'm going to give you this. I'm about to skip it. Get this. 20 people canceled their plans to sail aboard the Titanic because they had a dream that it would sink. Mm. Mm. That's amazing, ain't it? Yeah. Listen to this. Two months, 13 days was the youngest age of any person on board the Titanic. Just a two-month-old baby. Melvina Dean, who was a third-class passenger, survived in Lifeboat 10. 74-year-old, 10-month, 29-day-old Mr. Johan Stevenson was the oldest passenger on the ship, and he did not survive. He perished. There were 107 children traveling on the Titanic. Of these, almost half died in the sinking. Colonel John Jacob Astor IV was the wealthiest passenger. Now, I'm going to talk about this guy in just a minute. Was the wealthiest passenger on board with a personal fortune around $100 million. He was one of the richest people in the world at the time. Mr. John Jacob Astor IV would lose his life in the sinking of the Titanic. All the money in the world could not save him when the time came. The Titanic was four days into the trip traveling across the Atlantic Ocean when at 11.40 p.m. on Sunday, April the 14th, 2019 and 12, the Titanic struck the iceberg. The Titanic sank at 2.20 in the morning on Monday, April the 15th, just two hours and 40 minutes from the time it hit the iceberg. That ship went down quick. For it to be the biggest ship in the world, it sank quick because it was heavy. We'll talk about it here in just a minute. The iceberg was seen just 30 seconds before it was struck. The iceberg was around 200 to 400 feet in length and right at 100 feet tall. They only had a 30 second warning. That's all they had to move that big old ship. There wasn't enough time. The ship was traveling at 22 and a half knots. Just five knots below full speed at 23 knots. Not a care in the world. That ship was going almost at full speed. Knowing good and well there was icebergs in the area. Pride and cockiness said this ship will never go down. We're going to go through this Atlantic Ocean at full speed. I'm not worried about a thing. How many people do you know live their life like that? Living life full speed ahead. Not looking to the right or left. Not thinking about tomorrow. Not thinking about what happens between you and God in the future. That oh everything's going to be okay. I'm alright. I don't got to worry about anything. Destruction could be just seconds away. Right. The Titanic would take on 400 tons of water per minute after the collision. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. This is the sad part right here. The Titanic received six warnings that icebergs were in the area and they all were ignored. Every one of those passengers could have been spared if they would have just heeded the warning. The guy taking the, the, the Morse code messages, he brushed those messages off to the side. He ignored all the messages. How many people do you know ignore God's message? Ignore the message of heaven and hell. They come to church and they hear the Word of God preached and the preacher says, there's a heaven, there's a hell. You better get right with God. Judgment day's coming. Prepare to meet thy God. Consider your ways. You better get right. You better get right. 
You won't live forever. Your life is but a vapor that appeared for a little while and then vanished away. You better get right with God. Today may be your last day. And people all over the world ignore God's warning. That's right. Not knowing that destruction could be seconds away. Yeah. You could be a heartbeat away from hell. Do you get that? You could be one heartbeat away from hell and not even know it. But if you're lost, you're always one heartbeat away. There was no public address system or speakers. So, uh, as you can imagine, when they hit the iceberg, mass chaos would pursue. I mean, could you imagine being in that environment? You go from being in your bed, you're on the biggest ship in the world, everything was fine when you were at the bed, you might have kissed your kids good night, you might have kissed your husband good night, or your wife good night, laid down that night on that big old cruise ship, thinking, man, what an opportunity. And then, 11.40 that night, all chaos breaks out. People are running. People don't know what to do. They can't get a message because there's no PA system back in that day. They don't know whether, where's the lifeboats? How do I get help? Where's my child? Where's my husband? Where's my family? What, what, how, what am I going to do? Oh God! Oh God! What am I going to do? Help me! Could you imagine the panic that we pursued? The water was a bone chilling 28 degrees Fahrenheit. 4 degrees below freezing. A person could only live 15 to 45 minutes in those chilly waters. <clears throat> the Titanic only carried 20 lifeboats. This is the part that will make you mad. If you've heard about this, you probably if you know about the Titanic, you've probably heard about this. There were only enough lifeboats to rescue one-third of the total passengers on board that ship. There was not enough lifeboats to get everybody off. What do you call that? Pride. It's pride on the people who built the ship. Oh, this ship can't sink. It's pride on the people, on the passengers who got on the ship, saying, ah, we won't need those. Pride. Pride sends more people to hell than any other thing. I don't need God's salvation. I don't need God's lifeline. I don't need God. I don't need Him. You know what that is? Pride. It's pride. And it will send you to hell right. if you don't get saved. Two lifeboats failed and they simply floated away with nobody on board. It would take one hour after the collision for the first lifeboat to be let into the waters. An hour went by. And I got to read a little bit more. And they, they said the first lifeboat could carry 65 people that dropped down. Only 28 people were on board. The shit, that, that lifeboat could hold 65. There was 28. And they said it is believed that the passengers were reluctant to leave the ship because at first they still did not believe they were in imminent danger. They refuse to get on the lifeboat. The ship is going down. Water's coming on. And they still don't see their danger. They still don't see that death is only but a few seconds away. And they let that lifeboat go half empty. We see it all the time in church. Preachers preach. They give out the lifeline. They say, get in the boat. They don't realize how close they are to hell. And they'll walk out the back door every Sunday. They'll walk out those back doors lost, gambling with their eternity. Not knowing they can be in hell by the time they wake up the next day. <clears throat> there was not even enough lifeboats to carry the people. Almost 500 lifeboat seats were unused. Many ships at the time used strong steel rivets. But those used in the Titanic, they used weaker rivets that were mixed with iron and steel. That's why when the lifeboat, I mean, I'm sorry, that's why when the Titanic hit that iceberg, it just ripped to shreds. It ripped the rivets out. They were weak. They were supposed to be made out of steel, but to cut on money, I mean, to cut corners and save money, they mixed them with steel and iron. They could not hold up to the task of hitting an iceberg. 
The Bible says, prepare to meet thy God. The Bible says, consider your ways. The Bible says, because sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of man is fully set in him to do evil. <clears throat> you know what that verse means? It says that because God don't smash somebody as soon as they mess up, God has a little bit of mercy God has some grace, and because when you don't, when you sin that first time, God don't go squash you like an ant. It says that men build up a pride and say, "Oh, I got by with that. God ain't even watching. I can do this too." And they prolong, and they prolong. How about you? Are you ready to meet God? <clears throat> If you were to die today, would you go to heaven or hell? There's only three answers. Yes. Wait, wait. Heaven. Are you going to heaven? There's three answers. Yes. No. Maybe. Right? I don't know. Yes, no, I don't know. That means no. If you don't know, I would get sure today. I'm losing my voice. All of a sudden, it's went away. <clears throat> if you don't know, that means it's a no. The Bible says, for all have seen and come short of the glory of God. You're a sinner. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Because of your sin, you will die. And you will spend an eternity in hell. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. God offers you a gift. Amen. All you have to do is take it. You can leave here today right with God. Not having to be worried about what happens the next second. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. If you're here and you're saved, would you raise your hand? Put your hands down. It's a good feeling, ain't it? Amen. To know you're right with God. All these people that raise their hand, when they go to sleep at night, if they don't wake up in the morning, it's okay. Amen. Now, of course, you're going to miss family. They're going to miss you. I don't mean I, that's going to happen. But as far as eternity and God going to heaven, they're good. What about you? Heads bowed, eyes closed.